Are you worried about black holes? Consider this. Every time you accelerate, put your foot on the gas, quicken your step, get out of your chair, you generate an event horizon behind you. The more you accelerate away from it, the closer it gets. Don't worry, it can never catch up to you, but the UNRU radiation it generates sure can. Around the same time that Stephen Hawking was demonstrating the existence of the black hole radiation that would bear his name, three other researchers, Stephen Fulling, Paul Davis, and William Unruh, were looking at an effect that now seems eerily similar. They were independently studying how the nature of quantum fields appears to change depending on whether or not an observer is accelerating. They found that the simple act of acceleration cuts off your causal access to a region of the universe. It creates a type of event horizon. As we saw in our episode on horizon radiation, the presence of horizons distorts the quantum vacuum in a way that can create particles. This is the fulling davis unruh effect, or sometimes just the Unruh effect. It tells us that accelerating observers find themselves in a warm bath of particles. To understand this, we don't need general relativity with its space-time curvature and conflicts with quantum mechanics. We just need a little special relativity and a space-time diagram. We've talked about these before, but here's a quick rehash. A space-time diagram has two axes, time and, well, space, with time on the vertical axis. We can show an object's path through space and time using world lines on the diagram. For an object with a constant velocity, an inertial object, these world lines are just straight lines and the slope gives their velocity. A particle not moving at all has a vertical world line. Einstein taught us that an object without mass, like a photon, can only travel at the speed of light and no slower. On the space-time diagram, this is a line with a 45 degree angle from the vertical axis. This angle isn't anything special, it's just determined by the units of space and time that we choose. Objects with mass can never reach the speed of light, so the world line of a massive object, which includes any observer, has to be less than 45 degrees from the vertical. Extending light ray world lines backwards from our observer defines what we call the past light cone, the region of space-time that can have a causal influence on the observer. That's because photons fired from anywhere in the past light cone can reach our observer, either at the current point or at some point in their past world line. As our observer moves forward in time, as long as they don't travel faster than light, their past light cone should eventually contain the entire universe. Well, that's if you ignore the expansion of the universe. And this makes sense. If you wait long enough, photons from anywhere in the universe can catch up to you. At least you'd think so, right? But actually, there is a sub-light speed world line that can outpace light, or at least keep ahead of it. That's the world line of an observer undergoing constant acceleration. Acceleration means change in speed, so an accelerating world line is curved, the slope changes. Here's an example. Imagine my friend is traveling towards me, initially at close to the speed of light. For some reason they change their mind, I don't know, they suddenly remember they had something better on. They fire their rockets and begin a constant acceleration in the opposite direction. To begin with, that just slows down their approach speed. Just before they reach my space-time location, that constant acceleration brings them to a halt and they start moving back in the opposite direction. They then accelerate back up to close to the speed of light and keep accelerating. Okay, whatever, I didn't want to hang out anyway. That constant acceleration world line traces out a hyperbola and it has a very interesting property. If I fire a photon at the point of closest approach, say to send a message, that photon can never catch up to my friend as long as they stay on that hyperbolic trajectory. The photon will always be inching closer, it'll become asymptotically close, but it will never overtake. Now, this is only true as long as they continue to accelerate away, slow down or stop, and my message can catch up. In reality, eternal constant acceleration would take infinite energy. So after draining all of the energy in the universe, they'd finally have to stop accelerating and my message would overtake them. But until that happens, they stay just ahead of my photon. They also stay ahead of any photon emitted from this diagonal line or any point on the other side of it. This means that any events happening to the left of that diagonal line will never affect the accelerating observer, which sounds pretty horizon-like. 
In fact, the active acceleration does create a type of event horizon called a Rindler horizon. It's named after the coordinate system we use to describe a constantly accelerating observer in special relativity, Rindler coordinates, devised by Austrian physicist Wolfgang Rindler, who, by the way, also invented the term event horizon. The Rindler horizon follows at a fixed distance behind a constantly accelerating observer. Let's call them Rindler observers from now on. The distance of a Rindler horizon is inversely proportional to acceleration. The larger the acceleration, the closer the horizon. All parts of the universe beyond that horizon are out of causal connection with the Rindler observer as long as they continue to accelerate. But here's the weird thing. Even momentary acceleration generates a Rindler horizon. You don't need to pinky swear that you'll keep accelerating. It's like the projected future acceleration gives you a Rindler horizon in the present. And just as with Hawking radiation, that horizon cuts off your access to certain fundamental frequency modes of the quantum vacuum. The derivation requires a switch between inertial or Minkowski and Rindler space via the beloved Bogolyubov transformations, which are also used in the Hawking derivation. And here, they also lead to a mixing of positive and negative frequency modes in the accelerating frame of reference, which leads to the creation of particles in that accelerating frame. Those particles should have the same type of spectrum as Hawking radiation, a thermal spectrum. The vacuum should appear warm with a temperature proportional to the acceleration. This is the Unruh effect. Now, there's a big difference between the Unruh and Hawking effects. In the case of Hawking radiation, an inertial observer far from the black hole sees the radiation. This is because that distant point in spacetime is smoothly connected to the spacetime near the horizon. I mean, it's all one big spacetime. The only observers who don't see Hawking radiation are those plummeting in freefall towards the event horizon. But if an accelerating Rindler observer is in the same location as an inertial observer, the former will see that patch of space filled with radiation, but the latter will see an empty vacuum in the same patch. At first glance, this disagreement seems like a huge conflict. What if the Rindler observer accelerates fast enough that they are burned to a crisp by UNRU radiation? Does the inertial observer see some sort of spontaneous combustion? Where does that energy appear to come from if not from particles? A little less gruesomely, imagine the Rindler observer has a particle detector. Every time an UNRU particle hits the detector, it would click. And the inertial observer would agree that it clicked, but they wouldn't see the particle that triggered it. And this is actually the case. It's been worked out with math and everything. The proof uses something called an UNRU DeWitt detector. This is a fancy name for a particle in a box. This particle is coupled to the quantum field of interest, meaning it can exchange energy with that field. That means the particle can be excited into a higher energy quantum state when it encounters a particle associated with that field. So, as the detector accelerates, UNRU particles appear. The detector particle gets excited by an UNRU particle, causing the detector to click. But what does this look like for someone not accelerating but in the same patch of space? Well, they also see the accelerating detector click, but they argue that it's for a very different reason. When they perform the relativistic field theory calculation to understand the coupling between the detector particle and the field, they get that there's a sort of drag or friction term between the detector and the field that results from the acceleration that causes energy to be dumped into the detector particle. The source of that energy is the acceleration itself. The upshot? is that the very existence of particles is observer-dependent. Here's a specific example. A charged particle accelerating in a magnetic field emits radiation, Bremsstrahlung radiation. An inertial observer sees the charged particle itself radiating, its energy extracted from the magnetic field. But an observer accelerating with that charged particle sees it absorbing UNRU particles and then spitting them out again. The Rindler and inertial observers disagree on the source of the energy, even if they agree on the final result. So how strong is UNRU radiation? Well, don't worry too much. You need to accelerate at a rate of 10 to the power of 20 meters per second squared to increase the temperature by a, a single degree Kelvin. It's difficult to directly observe UNRU particles, although analogies have been observed, even in classical systems like this really cool study with water waves. One more thing. 
According to Einstein's equivalence principle, remaining stationary in a gravitational field is equivalent to acceleration in free space. That means you, right now, are bathed in a very tiny amount of unruh radiation. But there's one place in the universe where the gravitational acceleration can get that high. That's right above the event horizon of a black hole. If you hover close enough to that event horizon, you would actually be bathed in unruh radiation. Here we get to a really interesting question. What's the relationship between the unruh particle seen by someone hovering at the event horizon and the particles of Hawking radiation seen by a distant observer? Well, it's a great question, but it's one we're gonna to have to come back to. Right now, I have to jet, but not too fast, lest I combust in a fulling Davis unruh thermal bath as I accelerate to that future point in space-time.